There have been two schools involved in this project, ours and one other, and we've been given a couple of people to interview and learn about the black ta taxi history and what they do for a living. I learned that um, cabs actually have to do a knowledge test before they actually become black cab drivers and it takes over two years to learn and they have to learn the whole um, city of London, the six mile radius, which is a very impressive thing. Every cab driver that you're gonna to speak to, that you're gonna meet, has gone through the same system. They've all gone through the knowledge of London. They've all gone through that, that process. They've all gone through those interviews. They've all gone through the call overs. They've all gone through winters on their motorbikes, not knowing if they're ever gonna get warm again. We're all cab drivers at the end of the day. We've all achieved this green badge. We have that qualification, that's why. You know, we are in that unique group of 24,000. Um, one of the runs, yeah. Manor House to Gibson Square. Um, Leaving on the right, Green Lanes, right, Brownswood Road, left Blackstock Road, forward Highbury Park, forward Highbury Grove, right St Paul's Road, comply Highbury Corner, lead by Upper Street, right Islington Park Street, left College Cross, um, forward Milner Square, forward Gibson Square, set down. Yeah, well, one day my, my, my brother turned up with an old uh, uh, decommissioned London cab and he was going to drive it through Spain. And I said, wow, I said, I'd love to sit in that. And I sat in that and he said to me, imagine the history, imagine who sat in this cab. He said, imagine how much money has been passed through that window. And, I, and that was it. And I can remember, I just, got, I just got home from work and I was sitting there in my suit, shirt and tie. And I thought, wow, this is it. I knew from that day on, I was going to be a London black cab driver. I left school and I was apprenticed as a ladies hairdresser. To be a ladies hairdresser you've got to be very artistic. I'm not. I hated it. I went to work in an engineering company. I found out one thing. I don't like getting my hands dirty. I had no idea what to do and so I said when I came out of the National Service my father said to me you might as well go on the knowledge and that's what I did. Never looked back. And after I came out of national service, I was a bit of a rascal and going out drinking and things like that and getting in a lot of trouble. So my dear wife said to me, why don't you be like your friends and sign on to do the knowledge? I met a couple of ex-servicemen, ex-RAF actually, West Indians, who were on the knowledge, oh, they were just finishing, and they taught me into being the knowledge. I wasn't interested at, at first, but when I went to their homes, they were playing cards and I saw a lot of money on the table. And I thought, well, well, I'm, I want some of that. <laughs> My fiancé's father at the time was a taxi driver and his entire family were a taxi driver. So I didn't want to do this, but my father-in-law persuaded me that if there were any problems with the economy, if things went bad, jewellers would be one of the first people out of work. So as a backup, I did a suburban cab driver's badge, a yellow badge for Ilford. When we had a very bad winter, and I was a bricklayer at the time, uh, we got frozen off at work over the Christmas period, and I had two children, so I had no income. So I had to find a job where I could work, whether it was cold or whether it was hot. And a friend of mine who was a taxi driver said, why don't I do that? So that's why I did the knowledge. I was um, uh, married for 20 years and I decided to get a divorce and 
I was now bringing up my children on my own, so I thought it would be a really good job to do where I could work for myself and be around for my children. Well, I think as most London traditional families, there's always cab drivers within your family. So it was um, a job that I knew about and I had a couple of uncles who were cab drivers. And then I said, you know what? I want to do the knowledge. I want to study the knowledge of London. And then I approached my brothers, oh dear. And I told them what I wanted to do and they were like, no, you need to find an office job. No, it's, you, it's not safe for you out there. And they were like, they just freaked out. And I was like, oh my gosh. It's like, no, no, you need to find a desk job. And I was like, no, I'm going to do the knowledge. And I can remember saying to this cab driver, oh, you know, what do you do to become a black cab driver? He said, you've got to do the knowledge. And I said, oh, really? He said, I said, I said, what do I do that? He said, from a place in Penton Street. I said, where's Penton Street? He said, you just started the knowledge. Well, you have to memorise approximately 25,000 streets and even more places of interest along the streets, such as shops, restaurants, hotels, pubs, police stations, hospitals, railway stations, even statues. Uh, it was every single day except for Christmas Day. I was, I was either out on the bike or I was going to a knowledge school twice a week or I was calling over with family and friends. So for two years it totally took over my life. You live, breathe, eat, drink, knowledge. Everything is knowledge. You have to go out on a moped with a little clipboard at the front of the, of the bike with the runs on and follow a set route. It's long, it's hard, and you have to go out in all weathers. And um, you think you know London, but there's loads of parts of it that you've never really been to. My mother didn't want me to go on a bike in the streets of London in case I had an accident. So she didn't want me to be a London cab driver. So what I had to do for the first year, I had to do it secretly without her knowing. And that wasn't easy. So I still had to pay her some money for my keep. And I was still doing ladies hairdressing. And then I went on the bike and I went round like everybody else, but obviously it took me a bit longer. In those days, the knowledge took the average of a year, 18 months. I took two and a half years because I was doing it how I had to do it. Uh, the knowledge itself was, it was very, very much great fun. You used to ride around on your scooter with all the other knowledge boys. And yeah, they were, they were good times. You had a lot of fun. I was a single man. I wasn't married. I had no children. I had no financial commitments. And that's very important because I was able to do the knowledge under my own steam. You know, the easiest way is to join up to what was called a knowledge school, where you meet two or three times a week or every, every day if you wish to. Um, and you were kind of meeting other chaps and ladies that were on the knowledge of London and you could kind of all bounce off of each other um, with your different runs and your different um, points that you were asked when you had your appearances. We had the big maps. You had to, what we call cotton the run, meaning that say for example, there was George Street over there, and say for instance, there was Curzon Street over there. And you didn't know how to get from there to there. So what we had to do, we get a bit of cotton, we put the cotton across, and then every road that was in that road, we wrote down, and that's what you call a run. They will give you what you call a callover partner which is someone that's on the knowledge just like you. You sit down with a big board in front of you with the map of London and yourself and your partner, you'd call over. I loved it, absolutely loved it. Couldn't get enough of it. I loved the architecture, I loved the history of London. I absolutely immersed myself in it. It took me four and a half years and it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done. I did an English degree before that, because I, as I said, I was trying to be a teacher before that I, I did English at university. And the knowledge was a lot harder. I nearly lost all my hair from pulling it out. It gave me many headaches. I used to say to my mum, don't tell Junior and Errol, 
but I can't do this. I didn't realise how hard it was. And she was like, no. She's like, no, you're going to stick with it. The same way I helped you two brothers, I'm going to help you as well. And she'd say, like, and then she'd say to me, so where's your runs? Where have you been today? OK, sit down. Come on, let's call the runs. And there we would go. Because my mum did it with my other two brothers. I, I would honestly say that my mum knows London more than all three of us put together. Because she literally took us through the knowledge. About 70% actually fail. They give up. Because it's a, it's a marathon, if you like, rather than a sprint. Most knowledge boys at that back then would say the the most the things that happen most often would be older cab drivers pulling up to you next to you telling you the game's dead and the game is the game is driving a taxi and why are you wasting your time doing it because it's not any good anymore and they were like self-protecting their industry they didn't want too many people in it initially every 28 days once i'd applied for the knowledge i'd go up to the public carriage office, which was at 15 Penton Street, and I'd have my test. Never slept the day before an appearance. I tried to, but you just lie in bed awake at night, just trying to remember every street in London and every building. It was a, it was a very intimidating atmosphere. So, to give you an idea, in the in the waiting room, you may have blokes and they're six foot six foot tall. They've got noses like that and ears like that and they're sitting there and they're shaking and, I, and I'm shaking with them and, and everyone, it's like the whole room is just shaking and all of a sudden the examiner will come through, he shouts your name and, he, and he'll go really quickly into his office because it's all part of, of, the, of the game I suppose. So you don't, you know, you hear, you hear your name, Mr Freeman, you jump straight up, you're straight down the corridor and you're trying to look to see where the examiner has disappeared into. You'd have some examiners that were really hard and others were, they were all hard, but others were a bit kinder. And so you'd be sitting for 10 minutes in fear, please don't let me have, please don't let me have, and then they'd come out and call your name and think, oh my God, I've got him, I've got him. <laughs> and there's a table, the examiner would sit there and you would sit here. And you had to learn, good morning, ma'am, good morning, sir. Don't forget to do that because it will be a D on your card. If you don't come appropriately dressed, in a suit, another D on your card. That's how strict they were. Somebody just walked right into it, so they'd say, I don't know, uh, where's Wicked playing at the moment? Uh, Apollo Victoria, so right, go from there to, take me to Victoria Station, and I want this certain entrance. So they'd say, leave on Wilton Road. And they'd ask you four or five questions like that. And then at the end of it, you get a score, you get an A, B, C, or a D. So an A is six points, B is four points, C is three points, and a D is nothing. But to go to the next stage, you have to get 12 points. OK, Mr Pierce, um, are you ready? Yes. OK, so just explain to me a bit about what stage you're at. Don't want a full life story, but... No, full life story is on 2-2 uh, or 28. 2-2 20, and 28, so in theory we could be giving you your drop to uh, 21 today, Correct. if you do well. OK. So you're on six points and 28, you need 12 points to get through. Let's see how you do. Um, Westbridge Hotel. Uh, High Street, Stratford. Okay. And take me from there to McGettigan's public house. Okay, so I'm uh, ready to call. I can leave the Westbridge on the left in High Street, Stratford. Afraid, nervous, it'd be like going before the judge to see whether they're going to sentence you to prison. And Finlay, he was a Scotsman, he was the examiner. And he sat behind the desk and I could hardly understand him because he said, oh, take me to the institute, to the library. We could hardly under understand him. And he, was, uh, he frightened the hell out of all the knowledge boys. And then they'd ask you a question and he'd you'd know it or you wouldn't and then you'd have to work out like you've got the map behind me on London I, I, I had to have that in my head I had to have an imaginary map in front of me and I had to work out where the two places were that the, that the examiner had asked me straight line between the two points 
and then you'd have to tell the examiner every street and every turning that you're taking and every major intersection that you were crossing. And they would never tell you if you were right or you were wrong. They would just ask you another question. And then at the end of it, they'd say, thank you very much, next appearance in 28 days, 21 days, whatever it was. He asked me questions and I couldn't answer them. I couldn't answer one of them. And in the end, out of sheer desperation on his part, he asked me the street that I lived in <laughs> to, a, to a destination that I travelled every day in my life, going back from divorce to school when I was a little boy. And I managed to get one run correct. And I, I stumbled over that as well, even though I'd been doing it for years and years and years. It was as nerve-wracking as, nerve as that. Leave by Hammersmith Bridge Road, left into Hammersmith Broadway, right into, ha into Queen Caroline Street, forward into Hammersmith Road, forward Addison Bridge, forward Kensington High Street, left into Phillimore Gardens, right into Phillimore Walk, left into Camden Hill Road, right into Sheffield Terrace, left into Kensington Church Street, right into Notting Hill Gate, forward into Bayswater Road, forward Lancaster Gate, forward through Marble Arch, forward Oxford Street, left into Burner Street, set down on the right. The examiners in those days, they were all ex-policemen and they didn't particularly like cab drivers and they used to, an expression, wind you up, try and make you lose your temper. So if you if you, if you answered them back and said, who, who are you talking to? Then they'd throw you off the course and say, you're not a fit and, per, fit and proper person to drive a London taxi. And Mr. Finlay, I remember, sat there with two pencils up his nose at one, one of the examinations. Another thing, he would throw things out the window, bits of chalk or, or something. Or he would do funny things, just uh, which it would become um, it could become quite a, a game in the end. When you got your rec, which is the term that you finished the blue book and they're satisfied you know London and you do the, the suburbs. The suburbs means, oh, well out, over the bridge, South London, well North London. But you didn't have to right know all the little streets. All you had to do is how to get from here to, say, Clapham or Ballam the main road, that's all. And oddly enough, the last thing you do is the driving test. And it's, you, get four t you get four attempts at the driving test. And if you don't pass on the fourth attempt, you've wasted your time doing the knowledge. You don't get another go. And I got my badge and I was the king. I could have, I could have got into the ring with the, with the heavyweight champion of the world and beaten them. I could have, I could have taken on anybody. I was it's the best feeling in the world. Oh wow! You you walk on air, you walk on air, and you you feel like running up to strangers and saying, "Look, I got my badge. I'm through. I got my badge. I got my badge." Yeah, amazing. Yeah. It was one of those days I've never forgotten. It was like there was tears in my eyes. But when I got my badge, I was 39, and for a 39 year old woman to have tears in her eyes over something to do with an exam was most bizarre, but I had tears in my eyes, yeah. I think it's a, it's a great achievement what I've done, because remember I come from another country, come first here as a student, and then to achieve the knowledge like everybody else, I think is a massive achievement for me. There's also tinged with a bit of sadness because part of doing the knowledge is the camaraderie with, your, with the, the knowledge boys and, and girls that are doing it with you. And after you've done the knowledge, uh, you, you tend to sort of drift away. A lot of people they don't realise on the knowledge, it's your family and friends support you as well. And I was so proud to do it for them because they were happy for me as well. And I could, they could finally relax as well because they go through the same stresses that we do. So yeah, it's the proudest day of my life. And I got my badge. I got my badge. And I think most of the examiners were there that day because, you know, they, they wanted to see me get that badge because, you know, it took me five years. I, th I don't think I really could think straight for a whole week because then I was terrified that I had to go and get in the cab and start working. <laughs> when we got, I got my badge, the first thing you had to do, you had to go, in those days again, things changed today, I had to go to a garage 
and you had to sign up a contract with that garage to work either day or night. Normally, as you've just got your badge, you have to do a night work. And that's the only year for one year you sign. And that's for one year I did that. Just as you're completing the lodge, you, you, you can get a, a cab called, I think it's called a Wangle cab. Um, and it's, a, it's normally an old cab that you just drive around to get used to driving the cab. So you, they give you the cab for free whilst you're learning, um, but then you have a contract with them for a, a number of months. So it's quite seamless really. I just went from get my bill and badge, going to the, to the, to the cab uh, garage, and then taking out a, a cab for, for six or seven months. When I was working, you used to have the flat and you used to have the half flat. A half flat could be you're, you're paying half the rent, but it could also mean that you're sharing that cab with someone as well, someone who do days while you did nights or vice versa. That's the most economical way to drive a cab, is to share the cab, share the costs, share the driving. You also get home to see your kids grow up as well. That's a good thing or a bad thing, depending which way you look at it, you know. In those days, we used to work on a percentage of the meter. So the meters were red and you would pay in 60% of the meter so that you earned 40%. Now to get around that, we used to have a little trick and it was called stalking. And someone would, in the docks, they would come out and they would say to you, how much is it to Leicester Square? And you say, right, um, it's gonna be about 12 shillings if you sit on the seat or six if you sit on the floor. And if you sat on the floor, you didn't put the meter on. So you earn the whole six shillings. When you first get out, it, they call you a butter boy. <laughs> and uh, you've got to do three years. And every three years you renew your bill, your license. And um, so you've got to do three years of being a butter boy. When you were working for a garage, they called you journeymen. When you decided to buy your own cab, meaning that the contract you've had for the year is finished and you buy your own cab, they called you mushers. M-U-S-H-E-R-S, -S, mushers. Sherbet. I remember the first time someone said it to me, I gave them a blank look. Is it your sherbet? I'm looking at it. And then all of a sudden it clicked, you know, sherbet, dab, cab. Cabs are really difficult to start, so they used to go, used to rev, you'd shake you like this, and suddenly it would, it would catch, the engine would catch because it was diesel, and then suddenly all smoke and everything going in. The, the Wangle cabs were really old wrecks and they never had power steering. Oh, wow, you had to be so strong to try and turn the wheel and have to make sure you had done it on a bit of a movement. So even though it was just before my time, there were still cabs that still had the really, you know, the old, didn't have power steering. Vehicles were different. We had a, what we call the FX3, where in the winter, you knew it was winter because there was no, no near side door. That was where you strapped your luggage, your luggage into. And the heating, well, it came under the seat, but <laughs> very often it wasn't there. So you had to, you had to be well clothed up during the winter on it. For luck, you, when you pick up your first job, you never charge that person for that job. My very first experience was I kept forgetting to put my meter on. So the other thing I used to do, people would be waving at me and I'd wave back because I didn't realise they were actually hailing me down. So it took her quite a few days to get used to it. I used to go out sometimes at six o'clock in the morning and not come home till 10, 11 o'clock at night. That's when I had a young family. Um, that's when I had lots of bills to pay and lots of things I wanted to do. In that time, it was easy because A, there was only 5,700 taxis, so not so much traffic. There were less, fewer cars. There was more work in the outer areas, so you could keep out of the centre and still earn money. In the early days, it was great. There weren't any bus lanes in those days, um, but there was a lot less traffic, a lot less cyclists, a lot less motorbikes. 
So getting around was pretty easy. It was fantastic, it really was. I mean, there were no night buses, uh, transport home was uh, very limited, and so you were really busy. I mean, you would stop, and you quite often, uh, uh, people would get in both sides of the cab at the same time, and they'd jump in and they'd say, this is my cab, and they'd say, no, this is my cab, and they'd be arguing, and then you used to try and work something out between them where you took both of them home. Um, when I started driving, I think the pubs had to close at 10 or 10.30 in the evening. Uh, a few people had late licences, um, so you had to know where the late licences were. And I, I would earn, on a, on a Friday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, I, I would earn good money around the east end of London. Oh yeah, honest, yeah, it, really busy. And if you wanted a cup of tea and a sandwich, you, 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 you found a little dark street and you hid down it. And bloody hell, you'd only been there about five minutes and all of a sudden it's, you working? You said, yeah, I've got a sandwich in one hand and a cup of tea in the other. <laughs> no, not really, oh, I'll wait. And I used to wait and stand by the cab to finish your cup of tea and your blue sandwich, yeah. Yeah, good old days. South of the river at the time um, wasn't a very lucrative area. It wasn't an area that you'd like to get a job back from. Um, so you didn't really want to go there because you'd waste a lot of time going there and then coming back empty. Uh, this particular gentleman, he said to me, I was in Piccadilly, and he stopped me and he said, um, can you take me to Ballam? And I went, oh, yeah. I said, I said, really, I'm going home north, really. I don't, you know, I don't really want to go to Ballam. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going north. OK, he said, take me north. So I said, what? He said, he said take me north. He said, I said, well, wait, what's up? he said, well, I've stopped about 10 cabs and they're all going north. And it must be such a wonderful place that I want to go there. Of course, he called my bluff, didn't he? They set up these cab shelters so that it was a place where they could get warm and have a cup of tea as opposed to a drink. So then they would be ready and available and the gentry knew where to find the cabmen to, to get a cab. They would be in the shelters. I would use St John's Wood, which was the first shelter to be erected in London. And it was a nice group of chaps. Uh, a cabman shelter is, it, 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 it's like a nursery school for cab drivers. They all go very, very silly inside the cabman shelters. So you go into the canteen, everybody's talking at once, nobody's listening. If they put the price of the cup of tea up, they want to, they want to riot because, uh, you know, another tuppence on a cup of tea would be, would be uh, hell to pay. But it's normally jolly, it's loud, and it sounds aggressive, but actually there's what we call terms of endearment. It's quite a nice place to sit amongst uh, fellow cab drivers, people to understand the problems that you suffer during the day, the stresses that you suffer during the day. There's a lot of camaraderie to each taxi driver. They will look after each taxi driver, if we find one of our friends or, or acquaintances, it doesn't have to be a, a very close friend, somebody says, well, oh, Charlie ain't too well, he's, you know, he can't work and he's, you know, and he's, he's quite sick at the moment. And the drivers will all club around and help, help him, you know, and that's gone on for as long as I've been driving a cab. We were a band. If you saw a cab broken down when I first started driving, you would stop and say, Is it, you know, do you want some help? There sort of is an unwritten law that if you let a cab driver out uh, of a side road and just as he turns out, the person puts their hand up, that cab driver should point towards you at the back, you know, stick their hand out and go like that and wave the person they can't pick up. That's the unwritten rule. Sometimes it doesn't work, but normally on the whole it, it does. So, you know, there is that, there, there's sort of that code of, uh, amongst cab drivers. When business was good, they were reasonably polite. When business was bad, they were awful. They were, it's very, very, very competitive. And if you took a job 
in front of somebody else, you can almost guarantee the person behind you wouldn't get a job maybe for another half an hour, maybe even longer. And if you were sitting on the front of a taxi rank, which is quite long, you'd find people at the back of the rank would make a telephone call, pretend that they were someone that wanted a cab, you'd pull off, they'd all move down, but there wasn't really anybody at the address that you went to. So they were bluffing you and they were cheating you, really. I can remember I was seven or eight cabs back um, and I think I was driving, it might have been a red cab or something at the time, and this person, there was a, people at the front and the cabs were flying off really quickly and I saw this person on the front cab and then she walked down to me and I was like seventh cab. By then the first cabs had gone. So she got in and she was only going local and I said to her, why didn't you get, excuse me, why didn't you get the first cab? She said, because they're black cabs and they only go into London. The red, red cabs are local cabs. So after that, you sort of learn a lesson. You get out of that cab very quickly and make sure you're at the front just so you can have a little, a little wee wig. So it's, 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 you know, you only, you only happens once and after that you, you learn. Uh, there is a term in, uh, amongst cab drivers known as brooming a job because you're sort of brooming it on to the next person. So uh, I, was, I think I was brooming them that day. <laughs> Because of there's so many drivers that you know, and there might be so many Georges or Ted's or Johns, they would they would come with a uh, with a with a with a rider. So it would be oh, it's Watford John or John the Vest or Suicidal Tom, or all these kind of nicknames that people uh, accumulate. Danny the Fib, because he was probably a liar. Everything he probably lied about how much he was earning a day, or he lied about how big his house was. And uh, yeah, there used to be a guy called uh, Jimmy the Fish, uh, because uh, he used to work in Billingsgate, and uh, there was Suitcase Murphy, uh, uh, because <laughs> I don't know why he got the name Suitcase Murphy. We did. We did have one guy that was came into a shelter. You know the green the the, the green shelters that the cab trade has. And uh, he brought his friend in and he said, uh, my name's Ted. So he said, yeah, but what do they call you? Have you got a nickname? And he said, no, he said, I don't want a nickname. He said, I, I was born Ted and I want to be called Ted. And they all went, oh yeah, okay, right. But after that time, everybody called him no nickname Ted. I wanted to highlight uh, and break the wall of silence about Cuba. So I bought a brand new cab, white cab. I've always drove a black traditional cab and had the Cuban flag sprayed from bonnet to boot. And that, I drove that around London for 16 years, promoting Cuba, helping to break the silence on this blockade by the United States. From the 1920s to the 1960s, there was a lot of Jewish cab drivers. And then in the late 60s, uh, early 70s, there was a lot of black drivers. And then there's a lot of, um, say, Somalian drivers. Um, they get, one person would pass and then pass that on to their relations and say, this is not a bad job. And anyone, it's not um, restrictive. Any, anybody can do it. What's it like being a woman driver? <laughs> there have been times of intimidation. There's been times of verbal abuse but you know it's about you keeping your calm with that and learning how to either ignore or to when you respond respond in such a way that that person knows look you can't mess with me sorry we're here and we're here to stay when I started 24 years ago there was about uh, 50 women cab drivers, so we were a real rarity. And you could tell the Americans she was the only one. <laughs> and when you used to drive along, people used to point. You used to hear them say, look, there's a woman in that cab. You know, nudging each other on, each, on their arm to say, quick, look, look. It was like you were a, um, a circus act or something. <laughs> Years ago, I don't know about now, but there used to be um, the boat train used to come into Liverpool Street and the boat train used to come into Waterloo. And that had lots of wealthy tourists on who could go anywhere in London or the greater, uh, uh, you know, the home counties. So the trick of the trade was 
to get to Liverpool Street in time for the boat train to pull in. You know, it's about knowing what times happen in certain parts of the city. So, for example, we call it the burst. That's when all the theatres finish, about 10 p.m. at night time. So that's when you get down to the West End of Aldwych. Or you might go, if you have the radio on, if you know, if you hear the, the railway stations down, for example, like at Euston, there might be a security alert, or there might be a signal failure. You get down there because you might get a job going to a quite a far off place. It's never happened to me. But. I would get to Marble Arch, and there was a ho two hotels there where we would work out of, where you have a relationship with the doorman, and we would service that hotel. And with a bit of luck, most days, we got jobs to the airport person could come out the hotel, they get into the cab, they say, could you take me to Cromwell Terminal? Cromwell Terminal is Cromwell Road, they would get the bus to go to Heathrow. Now it was my job, because I want to go to Heathrow, I want to talk him in to go to Heathrow and make a good deal. So what I, because I own my own cab, I can do that. One sumo wrestler was waiting outside a hotel and you know how big these guys are? and he had a translator and they said, we want to go here. And I was like, fine. And then his three friends came out, all sumo wrestlers. And they, was, they were huge. And one got in the cab and the cab went Ehh! And the next one got in and he went Ehh! like that. And then I had to push the last one in, just about got the door shut. And I could feel the um, suspension almost hitting the road. That was quite funny. But they were very, very polite. They just wanted to go into a London taxi. There's still one or two little courtyards that I literally, they're courtyards, they, they're parts of buildings that you can zip in one end of them, zip out the other end of them, and you're in a totally different part away from the traffic. Things like that you can get up to. If I was a rich man, all day long I'd really, really wrong. If I was a wealthy man, wait. I wouldn't have to work hard. That'll do. That'll do. What every other cab driver is going to say, without even thinking about it, and that's the freedom. It's the freedom to be able to do what we want, when we want, and how we want. If you oversleep, and when you're a young man, and you went out, and you got up late, so you got up late. If you didn't want to go to work, you didn't go to work. You've not got to ask anyone for overtime, you haven't got to ask for time off, but every cab driver works for the every penny they get. Sometimes, I don't know, if you go on holiday and you need to get more money, you can work longer hours, you can go and find the money, whereas a normal job, you just get your wages and you have to live off that. Well, I think I've become a typical cab driver. I, I've had a back problem, I've had a heart problem, uh, fortunately, I haven't had a lung problem, uh, but I've got uh, a stomach to prove that I've been sitting in the cab for 51 years. In this job, you can get low. If you don't have a structure, you don't have some sort of discipline and order, you can end up maybe not working and getting behind. You're self-employed. Every time you go out to work, you feel like you're never earning enough money, and it, it's it's and it can get you it can get you down. I would say that, that marriages suffer in the cab trade. Just the loneliness of sitting in your cab and driving around and around looking for a job. And no matter what you do, you can't get anything in the cab. You, you see other guys with people in their cabs. You, the cab in front gets a job, the cab behind gets a job. And you're just driving and driving. You start to feel sorry for yourself and why is it me? And it, it makes you feel very, very lonely, very, very isolated. Doesn't often happen. When it does, it's a horrible, horrible feeling, I tell you. The best quality for a, um, a London cab driver, apart from knowing the knowledge and where they're going is to uh, know that you're going to get any sort of customer in the back 
They can be, you know, posh people with posh accents. They can be uh, working class people. They can be people that are very annoyed, very jumpy, people that have had to get a cab because they're in trouble, people that are on the way to a hospital. So you've got to deal with all types of people. And you're going to meet some really, really horrible people driving a cab. Some really nasty people. But you only have to tolerate them for 14 minutes. That's the average taxi ride is 14 minutes. I was only into the job, not a year yet. Ranking up on Charing Cross Station, the ruling is first cab, first job, and the gentleman refused to go with me. He went to the drivers behind, and they also refused to take him this. He got very irate, went for the police, and he insisted that he don't want to go with him. And he was very, very irate, very angry. The other cab drivers, I heard one of them saying uh, he doesn't want to go with a coloured boy. Now, I'm, I'm new to the job, I'm new to this thing, so this hurt very much. I sometimes wish I'd have sort of started off an autograph book from day one with, with all the people I picked up, which I never ever did. But you kind of look back at your, at your, your career and think, you know, if you did, you'd have a book filled with famous faces, really. You know, actors, footballers, film stars comedians um, and, uh, you know, really sort of famous people. I had, do you know Take That? Yeah, I had uh, Jason Orange, he's left now. But I, I kicked out a customer to get him in. <laughs> and I said, don't have to pay me. They, um, they, got, they were on the rank in Liverpool Street and the, the customer was getting out to get me money because she didn't have any money. So I was like, no, fine, it's get out because he was the first on the rank. It's fine, you don't have to pay me, get out, get out, because I absolutely love Take That. So he got in and I started driving and I forgot to ask where he was going because I'm so excited to have him in the cab. <laughs> Picked this lady up, she said, would you mind if she wanted the, um, she wanted the uh, Royal Opera House? She said, do you mind if I warm up? So I said, no, not at all. I thought she was cold, I thought she wanted the heater on. And then she, mum, 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 And she starts getting louder and louder and louder. And by the time we got to the opera house, I thought she was going to break the glass. The voice was so piercing. She was warming her voice up. I thought she was going to shatter a window in the cab. What's the most unusual thing anyone has done in your cab? <laughs> I, can't really, I can't really say here. Um, are you sure? Um, I picked up a couple once. And to cut a long story short, they started having intimate relations in the taxi. So I'll leave that to your imagination. <laughs> that was the worst thing. I had to ask them to stop because it wasn't very hygienic. <laughs> I, I, I love the um, banter. I had three of them in the cab from the upper house, House of Lords, they're unelected. They were from Northern Ireland. Um, Paddington, Paddington Station with their Northern Irish accent, and off we've gone. And I says, you're Irish. Oh no, we're British, we're British. I says, no you're not, you're Irish. You're from the island of Ireland, where the Irish people come from. So we had a debate and a, and a revolution all the way to Paddington Station. And also I think cab drivers after a number of years become sort of a, 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 a counsellors. I've had people get in the back and on the journey started talking and by the time that we've got to the other end of the journey I know their life story. Another time a guy got in, this was at St Pancras and he came up to the window and he said mate just, just take me to New Cross and he threw, the, threw loads of money through the window. I said okay, so I started driving towards New Cross. I got to Blackfriars Bridge I think it was and he said no turn around go back to Islington and he's going they're tracking me, they're tracking me. He was, he, he was paranoid, he thought he was being followed by someone. And in the end, he asked me to take him to a police station. He flung the door open and just ran into the police station. And I went in to check, I went in to check after him and the policeman said, did he pay you? I said, yeah, he paid me, he paid me too much. Well, I, don't, I don't need all this money. But he was very unwell, it was very unfortunate. But until I realised that, you know, it was quite scary as well because you're on your own when you're in a cab. I'm not trained to deal with uh, cases like that. So we can do is show compassion and, you know, try and help the best you can. And when the terrorist attacks happened, there was cab drivers that were taking people for free out of the area 
and it was a sense of this is our London, we need to protect our people. It leaves you with a huge sense of pride. The cab train is renowned for its charity work. We have a children's outing. We take underprivileged children. It really was started with Norwood Orphanage, which was a Jewish orphanage in Norwood, hence its name. But now it includes everybody. And we take children to the seaside for the day. In the old days, I used to take the children down, the underprivileged children down to um, um, South End once a year with uh, hundreds and hundreds of other cabs or take them to um, Worthing. If I was driving the cab and I was for hire and empty, you know, empty and for hire, I'd probably put on um, behind the taxi on the bank here outside the Westbury Hotel. That, that, that can move fairly quickly and because you're at a hotel, you can possibly get the, uh, the ultimate job, which is to the airport. When I began to get lazy, I decided to park myself at Heathrow Airport. It wasn't a pleasant introduction because at that time Heathrow Airport was run by what we call the Faces. Before the Union helped reorganize things, which I was part of that, it was like, uh, like an outlaw system, you know, a few Faces run things. And to get on the rank, to get a job, on each terminal there was about five spaces. So the faces will pull out and keep spaces for their friends and they will keep you back and you had to wait your turn. This is no word of a lie. I remember orbiting in the airport. I checked it for 30 miles before they allowed me to come on the ramp. In the early days, um, I used to see my wife's uncle who was one of the faces at the airport. And if I saw him, he would give me a fare back to London. All this was highly irregular and highly illegal because you're supposed to sit on the rank, take the first fare that came along. But these guys didn't work like that. The unwritten system was you had to work your way in, you know, after you under sufferance for a certain amount of period and they got to like you and you got in green, you, get, you got into it was the TNG at the time. They were very instrumental in bringing about these changes. By negotiation, the whole idea was to make it a fairer system for all. Because we have a feeder park system that you have to go through. So you could be waiting any time from an hour to four hours. It's like any other rank, except you have a chance of longer jobs, but also time to study. One of the things we also did at Heathrow was to set up a union learning centre. We've done this thing where you can learn, learn while you earn. So although you're sitting there for two or three hours, you can be learning Spanish, um, you can be learning computer skills, and you can be learning, you know, there's a whole range of different things you, you can learn. You can either go into the cafe and, and, and see your mates and have a chat, or you can go into the learning centre and do some learning, or you can read or play your saxophone or play your guitar, whatever you want to do in the back of your cabin. It's amazing what, you know, what instruments people play. You can hear it coming out of the feeder park. Then you, you're, you're, you can see your numbers counting and down. You're sent automatically by computer to a terminal that's calling for cabs. You go to the, to the, to the um, terminal. Again, you could go either go, depending on how busy the terminal is at that particular time, you can go straight in and off you go, or you can come to the back of the rank and you could be there another 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour even. So, so if somebody flagged me down in Knightsbridge or Piccadilly and says Terminal 2, Terminal 3, and I took them out to Heathrow, I'd do a U-turn and come straight back empty. I couldn't sit on the stacking system of cabs and wait three, four hours for a job to take me back to Liverpool Street or Piccadilly. I couldn't do that no more. I'd rather scoot around town, doing a little job here, a little job there, a little job here, a little job there. At the end of the day, it probably adds up to the same amount of money. But that's the way that they like to work. It doesn't suit me. I don't like sitting around. I remember in the old days, all the East End garages, you couldn't, as a cab driver, you couldn't go and hire a cab 
and work in the East End unless you was a member of a union. Initially, when I first started driving a cab, I didn't pay much attention to unions or trade organisations. And I'm sad to say, when there were trade organisation demonstrations, for one reason or other, I never joined in. I was always riding around the outside, thinking to myself, oh, it's busy, it's a bit busy outside, and you know, there's lots of work here, only because the guys that were demonstrating on my behalf, which I didn't really appreciate. It was only when I had been driving the cab a lot longer that I appreciated the necessity of trade unions and organisations that support the individual driver. It's very important. I think we've become more unified because and more we've, we've, we've bonded together a lot more since we've felt that our trade has been under attack from companies such as Uber. Um, I think obviously Uber is a massive, massive problem. Um, this is a company which is obviously backed by some big backers, Goldman Sachs, Google, I think, uh, are some of the backers. They work on a, uh, a business model, which means that they actually subsidise each fare up to 40%. Um, so Uber has never made a profit. It makes a loss, but it's making a loss because eventually what it wants to do is to make sure there's no competition. Uh, I think as well going forward is automation, driverless taxis. Uh, I know that obviously Uber are working on that business model as well. They're working on a model that in 10 years' time they will have no drivers. They will just have profit, profit, profit and be the, the, the one minicab company that you, you will go to. I just feel that private hire drivers need to have regulated fares or a minimum fare, a minimum per mile fare that they, could, they, they have to charge. That would stop this, this dramatic undercutting. It would also stop the, what I feel is the exploitation of drivers where they're not earning enough money after their expenses. Where the average cab today was £43,000, the electric cab now is going to be near enough £60,000, £65,000. If you want to invest in that sort of thing, you have to know that there's a, a future for investment. It's coming to decision time now. Do, you, do we need the famous London plaque taxi or not? Don't tell anyone this is our secret, but I've actually got a sat-nav programme on my phone. Shh. Uh, and it's very good because it gives you live traffic information. So when I left home, I set my sat-nav up to bring me here and I looked at the route and I thought, no, that, that's not the way to go. And I used my knowledge to get here, and I got here something like seven or eight minutes before the estimated time of arrival of when I left home. It's only seven or eight minutes, but the fact of the matter is that I beat the sat nav. I'd say it's been a it's been a really good job. I've really enjoyed my years as a cab driver, and I've loved it. I must admit, I have loved it. But the job isn't what it used to be, and nothing ever stays the same. Everything changes and unfortunately this is changing for the worst. Very proud to have been a London cab driver. Very proud. We're, we're the most famous cab drivers in the world. Hated by everybody in London, but loved by everybody around the world. Oh, you, you're always, you're a cabbie. You know, and I, I love it, I still love it when, when people howl you and they say, cabbie, can you take me somewhere? And yeah, and that's what I am. I'm a London cabbie. He owes it to his pretty little bride to London town for the honeymoon. Arm in arm they went to see the sight till late that afternoon. Joseph sight when folks began to stare. London's no place for a spoon is fair. Just then a taxi cab drew near. Said his wife, Joe, I've got the bright idea. Will you take me in a taxi, Joe? All around the town we'll go. You can kiss me down the thread. It's Piccadilly, squeeze my hand. Tickle me in Leicester Square. And make me smile. Love me all around Regent Park. And eight pence a mile. 